So let's start with a simple question. How do we find information? It's a really important thing to think about before we go too far down the rabbit hole of searching. Now we know that there's two typical styles that people use. The first one is browse and discover where we're looking for information and we happen across it. So we're discovering what we're looking for through a browsing process. And the second way is search and locate, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about later today. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about these two methods, because it's important to understand that FileHold actually supports both of these ways of finding things. When we talk about browse and discover, what we're usually doing is using a context clue to find what's needed. So we may not know specifically where that piece of information is, but we're going to use uh, references around to try to guide us to where that might be. Now this style does not require specific details about the document. For instance, you don't need to know an invoice number when you're browsing for a document. You're gonna come across it anyway. Let's consider a filing cabinet. When we look at a filing cabinet, we understand that if it's not labeled, that is if there's no metadata about what the contents are, and if you don't know what's in it, that is you don't have any institutional knowledge about the contents of it, you have to look through that in order to find the content, to find out what's inside of it. So the only way to discover it is to browse it. You actually have to physically look through. Now, there are pros and cons to the browse and discover process. I mean, one of the major pros is it allows for organic exploration, like a Wikipedia wabbit, uh, rabbit hole. Sorry, why is that wabbit there, Baxton? Like a Wikipedia rabbit hole. And if you've ever been on Wikipedia, you know, you look at one topic and then you hop to another and you hop to another and you hop to another. And eventually you find yourself in a very different place than where you started. And that kind of exploration can be an important part of discovering the information and the knowledge that you may have within your DMS. It enables users to fi in finding related information. So you're looking for A, but you find B. And B is related to A, but you didn't know that when you started. So you actually find out more details as you go. And it can show organized breadth of materials, like a folder full of related documents. When you're seeing things that have been nicely organized and gathered together, you can see those relationships automatically. But there are some cons to it. The first one is it requires strict organization of the system. If you don't put the document into that folder with the related documents, it's not going to be discovered. Think of a library where you may happen to have a folder full of press cuttings or something like that. If somebody misplaces a press cutting, it can't be located again. But it forces users to act as a librarian. If they don't keep that organization on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment, document-to-document basis, information can be lost and it's no longer recoverable. And perhaps most importantly, it's inefficient. If you're looking for invoice X, you need to find invoice X. You don't necessarily need to find the financial statements for a company related to invoice X. And that might be very useful sometimes, but it's ultimately it's an inefficient way of finding information. This is why search and locate is easily the most efficient way to find information online. It's used by most websites to show information. Think about almost any website you go to. You're using a search term to jump into there, whether you're shopping or whether you're browsing a library or whatever system you're using, you're usually jumping into that information. Now that system uses both informal information or, or internal information such as text of a document and information about the document or metadata. So we're relying on more than one way to find the information within that. It does not require strict organization because the documents can be found with minimal context. For instance, I might just know the company name and that's good enough for me to find the invoice that's related to it. I don't have to uh, go through multiple stages of pass in order to find what I'm looking for. It can be filtered to hone and refine results. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. It's not just one search. It's one search that can lead to a more narrow search. It can lead to an even more narrow search. So we can add filters and focus and refine that search as we're going through. And most importantly, it allows for search with details. So you, you find a little bit of information and that small detail is enough to find the information that you might be looking for. Now, browse and search can often be looked at if you look at a library and the different ways of finding information to there. Imagine you're in a library space and you walk into there. You can wander through the aisles. You can look at book covers, look at titles, look at labels until you find something of interest. Or you can use the card or the online catalog to find what you need. So if you know what you're after, you can find it straight away. 
Now, some search terms about this here. One of them is metadata. And you'll often, if you're a file hold user, you already know all about metadata. But let's talk about using it from here. A card catalog is an example of using metadata. Think of those old school card catalogs. And if you're old enough to remember them, then your, your back probably hurts. But if you're old enough to remember them, then you'll remember those big long drawers full of the individual cards that they have within there. And there'd usually be three of them. There'd be one by title, one by author, and one by subject. So you could find what you were looking for based on those three metadata searches. Now we've evolved that into an online catalog. Here's an example of something. I pulled this from the New York Public Library. This is their reference for Pride and Prejudice. And by the way, this is a very short version of what uh, might be available online. There's actually more and more pages of this. This is just the header page. And you can see that there are some, uh, some titles over this, such as the title, author, imprint, description, series, uh, bibliography. Those are all examples of fields of metadata. If you think of it in file hold terms, this is a schema for a book. And within that book, these are the tags that they'd have for the information. So this is how we're using metadata within the system. Now, before I dive into anything else, I just want to quickly go over some key terms uh, for within our search. And I'm more just saying this so that I say it now and you can remember it later. So the first one is FTS. And if you've ever looked at file hold search, you may see FTS. That stands for full text search. That's our common index of document text, metadata, and file properties. Now, the FTS is a filtered list, and we're going to see why that is in a moment. So we'll keep that in mind. The database, on the other hand, is a much more limited collection because it's only the metadata for the documents. And values when you're doing a database search need to be exact. So if you're using inexact terms, or if you want a broader search, use the FTS. The database can ultimately be a more efficient search. It uses less resources to find the information, but you need to be only searching for metadata and you need an exact match. We also see noise words as a term that we may encounter on occasion. And noise words uh, are ones that are common words that don't really add value to a search. So think of the, there, also. It's those kind of standard words that you might see in a document that don't really add a huge amount of value. The FTS is going to skip that information when we see it in there. We can treat it as a noise word. There's a couple of symbols on here. So you've got an asterisk, an equal sign, and a question mark. So an asterisk is used as a wild card. It's useful for um, an unknown uh, for search values. So for instance, one, two, three asterisk would return one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, because it's just saying, here's the first part, give me the rest of it. Whereas if I knew I was looking for a four digit character to start with one, two, three, an equal would be perfect because it's perfect for a digit. So you can use a wild card there and then it would find one, two, three, four, but it wouldn't find one, two, three, four, five. If I knew it was just the beginning and it could be anything else after that, I'd want to use a wild card. Otherwise, I'll want to use an equal sign. Now, if it's a character, I can use a question mark. So you can see that it matches your single character. APL question mark would find both apply and apple because there's only one letter of difference in between them. We just don't know what it is. And then finally, a blank. And it's something that I want to embrace when it comes to searching. So when we're looking for a document, don't be scared of a blank uh, within a metadata. A blank is null. It means that there's no information in it. So when we say, look for a metadata field that's blank, we're not looking for something because any character in there will give it a value and therefore it's not something that will come up with a search when you're looking for something that's blank. So you're going to see that on occasion for our modifiers. All right. Enough of this uh, preamble, let's take a dive in and look at search. So we're going to go into file hold, we're going to go into our desktop application, here we are, and we're going to start with just clicking the search button up here on the icon. Now you can ignore these down here, these are my saved searches, and we're going to be covering saved searches in our next session in a couple of weeks. So if you want to learn more about saving your searches and how to employ them, how to do quick searches, we're going to get much more into, into detail on that. Today, we're just talking about the mechanics of search. So let's first talk about the two different modes for search. There's a basic search and there's an advanced search. The way you get into a basic search is pretty simple. You simply click on the search button over here on the uh, left in the, uh, in the library, and that takes you to the screen, and then you can enter a value if you want to. So if I type in a value and hit enter, file hold immediately puts me into an advanced search mode. So the assumption that file hold makes is the next thing that I'm going to want to do is filter my results by doing an advanced search. So a simple search is looking through the entire repository of your system, looking for text, or metadata, and file properties of all of the contents. Now, a couple of really important details about searching. First of all, if you don't have a right to see the document, and remember we control document access using the schema, 
the cabinet, and the folder. If you don't have a right to all three of those, then those search then any documents that meet those uh, search criteria will not appear. So you can't search for documents that you don't have a right to see. So remember, it's always going to be a filtered list. I'm a system admin, so I see everything. So therefore, it doesn't really apply to me. But think when you're doing your search, your users are going to be limited to what they're allowed to see. The second important thing to remember is when we're running our search, we're looking at the current documents only. We are not looking at your historic records. So when we do a search, we're going to give you the current version of the documents. Now, there's ways to bring that in later on, but I'm going to show you, but I'm going to put a pin into that for a moment. So we do that simple search. We're only looking for current documents. We're also ignoring the library archive, which you'll see down here. So, you know, there's, a li uh, there's an archive down at the bottom underneath your library. We're ignoring that too because we're just looking for current documents and the current version in the active library that you have a right to see. So even though when we use the term simple search, when I come back to over here, there's all this mechanics working in the background that file hold is protecting you from. So you're not accidentally exposing documents or you're not seeing results for documents that you're not allowed to see. We don't tease you that way. So again, we're going to start off with that simple search mode and we type in our value and we hit enter and file hold searches the entire repository and shows me all of the documents. Now I'm going to just minimize my metadata panel here. Let's just shrink that off. We're going to see that we've got a relevance ranking that's listed down onto the side here. Now there's an algorithm that FileHold uses through our search engine in order to push documents up and down. So we can see this document here is rated at 100%, whereas this one is only 85, this one's 57, and those could actually be identical documents. It just depends on how FileHold has found them within this search. Typically speaking, when document, uh, if, some, if the value you're looking for is in the document's metadata, if it's at the beginning of the document as opposed to the end of the document, and if it's found in multiple places in the document, it's going to push it up in its relevance ranking. Now, obviously, you can sort your screen to look like however you want to. And if you're not playing with customized views, I highly encourage that. So if I was to go to just my standard default view, I actually get a little bit uh, different information onto this than I might otherwise. Like, for example, it's going to rank these by relevance first, and usually from least to most, because that's how I have this organized. But I could, of course, change that to most to least if I wanted to within this default view. So that's, again, typically what you're going to see in your results. And you can customize the default, you can customize whichever of your views you want to, to get the information you need on screen. Now, before I go into anything more about the mechanics, let's just talk about what we're seeing here for our advanced search. Again, I'm going to go back to that uh, simple search, and you'll see here I'm not seeing a lot of information. I have no documents, so therefore all of our buttons are turned off. I don't have any access to anything. I am truly limited to just this. So I type in my value, I hit enter, I'm in my advanced search screen, and now I've got some buttons. The first ones are the ones down here. We've got the ability to invoke a Boolean search. If you don't know about Boolean search, there's some reading for that on our knowledge base. We're not covering this today because Boolean deserves a session of its own. I'm going to be doing that probably in a couple of months. We'll do a detailed Boolean search one. I'm still learning a lot about Boolean searches myself. It's a very rich subject. I'm sure that there's a super user right now who's going, yeah, Boolean searches are really simple. They are once you know how to work them, and I'm still learning them in the process. So I'm not, I don't feel confident enough to bring that in today's session, but we'll do that in a future one. We can include the archive into a search. So that's again invoking that archive down here, otherwise we'd be excluding those results. We can include all document versions. So instead of just looking at the current version of a document, look at prior versions and bring me those results as well. And finally, search using historic metadata values. Now these historic metadata values are when you've updated a document and you've removed metadata fields from it, we can bring those fields back in because they're still in the database, they're just not displayed. And we can use those historic metadata values as well, those previously used values, and bring those back in too. So that we're sort of using, it's kind of coming to that same idea as previous versions anytime we've saved that information. Now if you wanted to always search within the archive, for example, I could select this. And then I can come over to here and hit the save button. For those of you who know what a card catalog is, then you probably know that that's a save icon because it looks like a disc. For those of you who don't know what a card catalog is, I'm just going to tell you that's an old hard di or an old floppy disk that we used to have. So little diskettes, we used to save information. So when we click that, we save our preferences and it means that now we're going to be say, including the archive every time I do that simple search. So let's just rerun this search. So we went from 53 results to 60 results. So we know that I did a simple search search was 53. Now that we're doing an advanced search that includes the archive, we've got 60. So let's go back to our basic search. We'll type in our value and hit enter. 
And we're now getting 60 results because part of our baseline for searching now includes the archive because that's what I've saved. If I don't want that anymore, I can take that off. So again, we're just sort of saving those primitive settings into there for these four basic categories. So there's our first thought about that. Now we've got our standard buttons up here. You'll recognize these in file hold 16.3. That's the version we're using right here. And if I select a document, buttons will turn on and off depending on my rights to them. So if I select this one, for example, different uh, elements will turn on and off. So again, I'm seeing those uh, part of the search and part of the capabilities of it. We also have two more buttons here. One is save as save search, and we're going to cover this in the next one because that's how we actually, once we run a search, we can save it as a save search. We also have our highlight results. And highlight results is going to bring back um, any of those, um, uh, it's going to show me where it found the content if it's within the text of the document or within the properties of a document. So let's say, for example, I have this document here. If I open up its uh, metadata and file properties, I'll be able to inspect this to see where it found the value, in this case, under the sales rep field. This is a sample document. That's where I happen to put it. But if I wanted to, I could also ask this to highlight the results in case it found it within the text of the document. And then I can scroll through my document. Let's just undock that to make it a bit bigger. And sure enough, this is where it found the value within that. So this lets me preview the document without any formatting. So it's a very inexpensive, and when I say expensive, I just mean it doesn't cost a lot of resources to bring up this view to it. And of course, because we're dealing with, uh, with a PDF, I could always right click on this document and I could ask to open this up in the file hold viewer. And then it's going to pop open my viewer down below. And again, I'm going to undock this because I'm on a single screen. And then I can go through my document and preview it. Notice that it's giving me a red highlight around a green box here. So it's shown me where it found the example of the information. And I can also browse through this. So I can jump from page to page if I wanted to to find other points of information. So I'm not just limited to what I'm seeing in that first screen. I can use this uh, thumbnail option to jump around the document. So the viewer is very handy with this here. You'll see that there's a search icon up here and I can even refine my search as I'm going. So I could add more terms for it and let the viewer take over for what it's showing me for my results. But again, I'm just gonna close this out now because more what I wanna show you today is finding results for the document and how we can refine that in the process. I want to keep in this simple one tab mode here for my advanced search. If I wanted to add more filters to it, it's very simple. I can just hit the green plus sign and I can add as almost as many filters as I want to. I think I can go up to eight levels of filter deep onto this before eventually the icon disappears and that's as many filters as I can put onto it. Trust me, if you need that many filters, you're doing a very, very complex search and you'll find this quite adequate to find everything that you need. Now I could close all these if I wanted to, or I could just come up over here to click advanced. And it'll put me back into that mode. Now the reason I'm comfortable with doing this is because this is exactly the same mode as the simple search. If I go to simple search and it shows me this bar, if I go to advanced, file or metadata in the full text search in the FTS, that contains one, two, three, four, five, six. That is a simple search. I'm just in an advanced search mode. So before I go too far down this road, let me show you a couple of different ways that we, when we're running these search terms into here. The first one is there's an assumed and in between each one of these values. So for instance, if I type one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I type in six, five, four, three, two, one, I'm saying, show me all documents that contain one, two, three, four, five, six, and six, five, four, three, two, one. So now if I run that search, I'm down to eight documents. I don't have anywhere near as many as I had before. So we're treating this now as a different, as a unique search that's showing me documents that have both of these at the same time. Now, maybe instead of saying one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm looking for documents that have both of these at the same time, in which case I can put in the phrase or in between them. Now, or is normally treated as a noise word, but where I'm using it here, it's actually going to be able to run the search for me to find both documents that have these values at the same time. So an or separator in between them takes the place of an and. Or think of another way, um, show me all documents that have one, two, three, four, five, six, and or six, five, four, three, two, one. But that's obviously getting too technical. Now we can also introduce this using a phrase. And anytime I want to capture a phrase, so if, I, mean, so I was to look for the word lorem and sample, I'm doing it, let's try spelling that using English. So lorem and sample, that's what I'm running. I was saying, show me all documents that have the words lorem and the word sample at the same time. If I put quotation marks around it, I've now turned that into a phrase. So show me all documents that have the words lorem sample. By the way, if you use the quotation marks and you're capturing a noise word like a the, 
file hold will still skip that word. Using the quotation marks does not invoke a noise word back into the search. So now when I hit enter, it's going to show me all the documents that have lorem sample as a title. And so it's limited that search down that way. So let's go further with this. Let's take a look at some of those wildcards that we were seeing before. So if I was to type in one, two, three, four, and an asterisk, we're now going to do that same search I was doing before, although we're saying one, two, three, four, and anything that follows one, two, three, four. So in this case, it's going to try to find the five sixes. But you see, I've gone from 53 results to 111 results because I've greatly expanded the breadth of the search. Now, we could have also used in this case, we could have said, I want to see all documents that have one, two, three, four, five, and then have an equal sign in it. So I don't know what that last value is going to be, but I want it to be an equals. So I know it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, etc. So any of those documents that have that. And again, it's pulled back 61. So I know I've increased the number of documents that I had in my search. So we're able to see more results coming into it. If I wanted to do a search for, I remember our last one there was APPL with a question mark. So that's giving me a search for everything that's got Apple and apply and all those different values. And if I select my first document here and go to highlight results, again, it's going to download the text of this document. It's going to display it for me. Let's undock that to make it bigger. Is that going to show it to me bigger or am I, oh, there it is. So there's where it found the word apply. We can see that onto there. And then I can scan through this if I wanted to, to find any examples of that. And by the way, this will also show up within the, uh, within the text search. This is, happens to be a huge document and I might end up having to go page by page with this, but you can see apply is all over the place for it. So again, we've got that context for our document. Perfect. So I'm just going to close my uh, highlight results. So there's an example of where we're using some of those wildcards within our search. Now there's one other one that we can use, and that is a uh, wildcard in the middle of the document where we want to employ a fuzzy logic, where we're going to say that uh, you know it could be any character that exists within one space. And the example that I have built for that is I was looking for the company Megacore, and I realized that maybe when I was scanning it, it misread the... Uh, the zero into the wrong value. So I'm going to put uh, the percentage sign into there and we're going to then RP. So we're essentially saying anything that happens to be in the middle there and invoke a fuzzy logic to the search. So we can find where it begins with that and ends with that. And then I can run my search through and look for any of those documents. And sure enough, it found our document that had a zero accidentally misscanned in the wrong place. Just use as an example, that's another one that we can use is that percentage sign to do a wildcard search. Punctuation for the most part is going to be interpreted within this search bar as a space. So for instance, if I search for the word C-A-N apostrophe T and search, it's going to skip that apostrophe and not treat it as a punctuation mark, so it's going to treat it as a space. So essentially we said is show me all documents that have C-A-N uh, and a T. So that can actually bring you back a lot of results. So contractions are not a great thing to be searching for because they require that punctuation mark in between it. So again, be careful for those. So that, and then when we include our noise words, the other piece of advice is don't search for words that are two letters long. Two letters and a wild card is going to be more efficient because two letters is often going to bring back too many results. How do you know when you found too many results? Well, there are controls within the system administration menu that lets you uh, do the maximum number of search results, which is typically 5,000. So if you ever get a result back that says you found 5,000 documents, you've come up, you've run out of results. If you do a search that includes a database search, we're going to increase that to 10,000 because it's a more efficient search. So if you ever see a standard search, you do a simple search that has over 5,000 results, you know you've probably over-searched. So try again on that one. All right, now there's a bunch of changes that we can make to these as they're coming across. And there's some of these different categories. The first one over here is the criteria field selector. And this is your general search term. Now in that basic search mode, we're searching for file or metadata as broad as it's possible to be. This is also the only one that we can have more than one field of. So for the rest of these, when I change the criteria field selector, I can only have one value for them. And that kind of makes sense because if I'm saying I want to search for all documents that are within the 2022 folder, that's fine. I can do that. But it's not, I'm not going to ever be able to find a document that's in the 2022 folder and the documents in the 2018 folder. It can only be in one of those two places. So it's going to come back with no search results. So that's why we can only use one of those filters. But I could use multiple levels of file or metadata search because they're just broad FTS searches. 
Our second field on this is the search operator selection. So this is saying what kind of action that we're doing. So what we were seeing before here, file or metadata that is in the FTS or is not in the FTS. So it allows me to put a negative onto this. So it lets me spin this into a negative statement as opposed to a positive statement. We also then have the search criteria value. This is what I'm actually searching for. So when I type in one, two, three, four, five, six, that's my search criteria value. We then have our adding more filters into it and then our search function. So those are our major buttons. All right, tour and syntax over. Let's dive into this and first start off with the criteria field selector because this is where we get into the real nitty gritty of changing how file hold is gonna be searching for information. So under the first one here, FTS, full text search, You'll see we've got file or metadata. That's what I have active now. We can change this to file only. So now I'm only gonna look in the contents of the documents. So we'll run that search. There's our 20 documents. Or I can change this to metadata only and run that search. And we come up with 42 documents. Now, 20 plus 42 equals 62. So we know that there's crossover between these. We're not saying that if the document has this value in the text of it, ignore it because it's only in the metadata. We're not saying that. We're saying this is where it's in the metadata only or where it's in the text only and there will be crossover between those. Now, If you're a super user, if you're a system admin, you may also have access to the raw query. We're not going to be looking at that today. We're going to come back and look at that when we do our Boolean search session. This is effectively looking at a non-filtered list. It's a much, much more expensive search and so we typically don't let uh, anyone other than people who really know their searches use this. But if you have a super user, then you definitely want to give them raw query capability. And I encourage people to explore that within our knowledge base. There's a lot of information there on that. Document name. This is pretty simple. This is the name of the document as stored within file hold. So this is your file name, essentially. So when I say search for one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to find all the documents where that word is found. Now, in some cases, you may have an underscore that captures around that word. That's a perfect use for a wildcard. So let me do this search again, bracketing this with a wildcard and hitting enter. And it expands out the search because now it's found things like one, two, three, four, five, six underscore, because it's going to treat that underscore as a character within the word as opposed to a freestanding word. And when I'm doing a document name, it's like doing a database search. I need to be exact in my terms. So this is how you can expand the use of document name is to don't be afraid to use wildcards around it to find the value you're looking for. For my uh, mode here, if I want to change the search operator selector, I can go to contains an FTS. So I'm looking through this for the FTS. I can go to the database to expand to um, make my search a little bit more efficient or say equals or does not equal. So looking for an exact match of the term or does not equal. So for instance, if I was to say, show me all documents that equals that, I come back with no search results because I have no document that equals that value. But I've got the entire repository does not equal this value. So I'm not gonna run that search because I'd bring back all my documents. All right, our next category on this is checked out status. Is the document checked out? Now this is one of the few of them where the search operator selector does not change, it's only equals. And that's because all documents in the system are checked in or they are checked out. A document that is not checked in is a document that is checked out. So rather than confusing people by saying uh, does not equal checked out, we just say checked in or checked out, pretty simple. File uh, person, who owns the documents? We're dealing with ownership here on this category. So we're saying, I wanna see all documents that are owned by me or equally all documents that are not owned by me. So running this search will show me 130 documents that I don't own, which makes sense because this is my test environment. I've added most of the content into here, Probably I'm going to own that, those documents too. Now where we get more interesting here is where we're seeing person uh, check uh, owned by somebody else. So here's where I can then say, sorry, let me select that again. So owned by somebody else. And we're going to say equals. And I've got a list of all my users. So I can choose which of the users. So show me all the documents that Johnny owns. And run that as a search and no search result because Johnny hasn't added a document. Does Andy own a document? and he owns eight documents, so I can see that into there. Now, you'd probably never start a search this way. You'd probably never sit down and say, I wanna see all the documents somebody owns, but this is a great search filter to use later on. Show me all invoices that are not owned by me that were added to the system in the last week. That's a really logical search because you wanna see what someone else has added. If you're the main person who's adding invoices, you wanna see if someone's add, someone else has added a document. So you can build that search fairly easily. So we first start off by saying, I want to see all documents that are invoices and then we add a filter into that and we say and I want to see the ones that are owned by somebody else so we're going to say 
uh, owned by me and does not equal me. So this is any other user who's not myself. And I run that search and I have no search results. So I know nobody else has added an invoice into here. Perfect. That means I know what ha what's happening with all of my invoices. Very simple kind of search that you can run. All right, let's go back over here to the uh, these upper fields. We also saw it checked out by me, checked out by somebody else, might be useful. File date, here's where things get more interesting and we get a lot more variables. Let's go back to that uh, owned by me for a second and we see we've got equals and does not equal because they're very basic ones here. But when I choose the creation date for a document, remember creation date is when the document was added into file hold, not when the document was created. Very important detail. So when we look at the creation date, we have a whole bunch of modifiers here under the search operator selector. So the first one is equals or does not equal. Give me everything that was added today, everything that was not added today. So those are pretty simple. In the list, I've got a list of values and I wanna choose from those. Not in the list, something that's missing from that list. So again, in the list is a slightly more efficient search than an equals because you're getting into a much more accurate point to get into because you're only pulling from an existing list. Between is something you can only do with a date because we're able to use a range for this. So I wanna see all documents that were created between the first and today and search. And I've got two documents that were added in the system in that time, which is fine because it's a test system for me, but I'm able to use a range of dates for this. If you ever have a choice between a text field and a date field for something that's a date, please, please, please use the date field. It's so much more powerful. All right, uh, sorry, let's go back to our modifiers over here. We've got, uh, we've got to, you know, greater than, we've got less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So again, showing everything before a certain date or after a certain date. These are my two favorites down here, at least. So first of all, all documents that are at least 14 days older than now, that would show me every document in the system pretty much. However, I could also say no older than. So show me all documents within the last two weeks. And there you go. There's my documents out in the last two weeks. Very simple search to be able to run into the system. Now we can also use this. Uh, you'll notice that one thing that's missing here is blank. Now we're going to see blank when we see uh, metadata fields that might have be using a date. But in this case, all documents must have a creation date. They were added into file hold, therefore they have a creation date. So we don't get a blank value onto that. What we might get a blank value on, however, is date last modified. And that's where, oh no, we don't get a blank on that one too because date last modified will be creation date. Sorry, that's my mistake. I overthought myself there. Uh, but this is an example of how we can use those dates to truly find the information that we're looking for. So again, it also gives us uh, date last modified and if you're using workflow, approval dates or review dates. Workflow status, uh, again, we've got approval or review status. Remember, all documents in your system will have one of five statuses. Either they have not been submitted for approval, either because you're not using workflow or because the documents don't have a workflow process associated with it, or they are pending approval, they're in a workflow process currently, or they are approved, or they are not approved. The fifth status is approval postponed, which isn't used by everybody, but it's available there. So all your documents have one of those five statuses. So again, going back to that invoice search, show me all invoices that are owned by somebody else that have been added in the last two weeks that have not been submitted for approval. Now I can find my invoices that have not been sent through the system automatically or been run through that workflow. So keep that in mind. All right, our next one down is library location. This lets us focus the search to one area or another of the library. So I can always turn this on here and say, I just wanna search in my 2022 folder and that's it. That's the only place I wanna be looking at. Now we can get into that same search mode in other ways. We can always get into that if we want to by right clicking on an area and asking it to search. And what that does is it automatically populates the library location and then gives me the rest of the metadata. Now I'm gonna come back to this in a moment, but I wanna keep this in mind that I can always start off my search with a location. Or if I didn't have that in there at first, I can then add that in later on because I realize I'm getting more results back than I need and I wanna now specify a location so I can bring it in that way. Keep moving down over here, we've got document log. These are your actions for the system. So these are things like when you've recovered a document from, uh, from the deletion or when it's been converted to an electronic document or when the ownership was changed or any of those actions that file hold is cataloging. So these are usually distinct from document actions, usually uh, actions that happen about the documents or affect the document, but aren't actually usually changes to the document. Although new versions is, is a part of this as well. And then we've also got our document uh, log uh, date. So if I want to use a date range search that I can, so I can say, show me all documents 
that had that were scheduled for deletion on a certain date. We're usually using the document log date as a secondary filter on it, but you could use it as a primary if you wanted to. And then finally, our special fields. So these are things like the folder name. Now, folder name here is different than the folder name for the library location. Folder name over here is useful for finding all, doc, all folders that have the same names. Let's say you're doing a lot of chronological filing. You'll see that ab above there, I've got documents sorted by years. So I've got 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, etc. Maybe I've got a whole bunch of folders that all have 2023 in the name of them, but they're in different areas of the system. The folder name lets me bring those into the search as well. File size, show me everything that's above a certain level of megabytes. It's going to express that in megabytes, so I can say show me everything that's greater than 10 megabytes, and I can look for those larger files that happen to be in the system. So use whatever size makes sense for you. File type, what is the extension on that? So if I want to see a list of the file extensions, these are the kinds of documents I have into the system right now. And again, a useful search. Show me all invoices that are PDFs, and it's going to help me to find some of those scan documents potentially. Moving on to the next one, we've also got, uh, sorry, under file type, we've got file hold ID. Every document has a file hold ID number, so that's an easy search to find it. Document and version control numbers, if you're using those, those are optional, they're not required, but if you are using them, you can use that as a search criteria. Whether or not it has a markup, if you're using our level two viewer, whether or not it has a link to another document, whether or not it's a favorite, or whether or not, uh, and what its document format is. And the format for that will either be a document, a record, or an offline document. So the three file hold categories for a document. Now, everything that we're seeing above this line uh, so for everything from document name down to special fields is what we would consider administrative metadata. You can't change those values. You can't go into a document and just rewrite it so that you can say, oh, the owner of this document is now Bob instead of Chris. You can change the ownership of the document. FileHold completely allows that, but you're influencing the metadata. That administrative metadata that we're storing is fixed to the document. You can influence it, but you can't directly change it. Everything below this line is your metadata that you've built into the system. So it's going to have a list of all the schema that you have built into the system. And if you're using FileHold 16.3, we now get to use the mouse wheel to move up and down on this. So if you haven't uh, upgraded to 16.3, that's actually a really good reason to do it because it saves me so much time having to scroll up and down. Anyway, uh, these are all the schema that I have built into the system. I've got a ton of schema because I'm dealing with demos for all different areas. So you probably won't have as many as I do, but that's fine. When I hover onto a schema, I can always say I want to search for just this one schema. And now it's going to change the search to document schema equals AP invoices or does not equal or it's from the list or it's not in the list or I can just change the value over here to a different schema if I wanted to. I can also drill down and get into the metadata fields for these. So instead of saying I'm looking for a generic piece of information, I want to see all documents where the PO number for the invoice equals 123456 and run that search and it shows me just those documents related there. So I'm able to really drill down and capture a field for this. Now there's lots of clicking to do onto that, which is why using a save search is such an effective way to bring those in later on. And we're going to cover that in our next session, but I wanted to show you that this is where I can get into the much more specifics. Now those of you who are wise will see that and go, wait a minute, you're looking for AP invoices PO uh, number. What if it's a different PO number? What if it's a PO number, but it's not an invoice? That's where the common metadata fields come into place. And if you're not using common metadata fields, I'd highly recommend it. If you have a piece of information that exists on more than one schema, but have different names to them, I'm going to encourage you to think about that and perhaps change the name of your metadata fields to the same one. Now, there might be some work to transfer that over. And if you've got 100,000 documents into there, I'm not giving that suggestion blithely. I'm not being casual with that. But I am saying that when you're building out a, a, a document schema, consider using a common metadata field. So instead of my having to uh, look for the POs for invoices, look for POs for sales orders, and look for POs for packing slips, I can instead go down over to here and say, show me all documents where the metadata field for PO number, regardless of schema, matches this value and run that search and there's my nine related documents that all have it so whether it's a bill of lading or an invoice or a sales order or a purchase order i found that information into there so anytime you can use a common metadata field you should all right last thing i'm going to cover before we're going to open it up for questions we'll just this will just take a second how to get into search obviously we started off by clicking the search button over here and it takes us into this basic simple search and that's how we get into that if I want to start an advanced search, 
the easiest way to do that is either click this and then click advance and it takes me into the screen where I can start to modify and put my fields into this and change my criteria field selectors and my search operator selectors and my search criteria values to everything exactly how I want. Or, and let me just go out of this for a second, so I'm just looking at an area, or I could also come up to here and click this button and it puts me into an advanced search. Now, anytime I use this search bar up here, and we're going to cover more of this next time because a search bar is powerful, but it's even more powerful when we start to bring in quick searches and those who so will cover a lot more of this. This is always going to be related to the area that I'm in. So if I'm in my 2022 folder over here and I click the advanced search button, it is file hold assumes that my search is going to be for the 2022 area. If I'm not in a particular context, so for instance, if I'm up in the inbox, remember the inbox is not part of the library, and I click my advanced, it's just going to put me into a generic advanced search. So file hold assumes when I'm using the search bar up here, I'm doing a search in the area that I'm looking at. That's very different than a simple search. So if I was up here in the inbox and I come up to this and I type one, two, three, four, five, six, and I run my search by hitting enter, it's going to give me basically my file or metadata. But if I was over here in my 2020 folder and I do the same thing, so now I'm going to come up to here and I type one, two, three, four, five, six, and hit enter, file hold assumes that my search wants to be in my 2020 folder. So it's going to put that context into there. So this is always context related. So to get into a simple search, click the search button. To get into an advanced search, click search button and then go advanced. Or if you're nowhere in particular, just click the advanced search button up here. If I want to do a simple search from context, I can either type into here and it's going to remember where I am. If it doesn't, then it's going to give me the results for a simple search. The other option is right clicking on a part of the library and doing search and it's going to preload that library location. Lots and lots of different ways to get into search and I want to encourage people to play around with that. And that's going to cover everything for our simple and advanced search, our basic and advanced search. So I know there's a lot of content into there. Our next time we're going to meet, we're going to start looking at saving these searches and employing them, saving them as built searches, as empty searches, as quick searches, invoking quick searches from up here in the bar versus a simple search. And we're also going to have a look at fast find. So being able to use those searches outside of the file hold library, outside of the screen, remember another software.